for being here and those of you that are remotely, thank you for joining us uh, for this first uh, um, webinar on the series uh, for the spring of 2015 from the University of Colorado Denver and uh, free and open source software for your special applications. And today we have the pleasure to have as our guest speaker, Ricardo Oliveira. As a matter of fact, he's one of our great students and undergrad in geography. Uh, he's going to graduate this coming May uh, and uh, he has interest in web mapping, web applications, and he's considering applying to our new master's in applied geographic information science and technology that will start in the fall of 2015. So I will let, let, leave uh, Ricardo take over now. We, he's gonna talk for 50 minutes and then uh, questions for 10. So again, thank you for your participation. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those who are Join remotely. Uh, since that's going to be the, our first um, talking slash workshop uh, about the Phosphor G Lab, we decided to start from the basis. Uh, we decided that it would be nice to give a broad overview of what is QGIS and what is PostGIS and how you can combine to do together to create a really powerful free and open source uh, GIS platform for it to work. Uh, first of all, you know, the based stuff, what is the Phosphor G? Phosphor G just stands for free and open source software for geospatial applications. You may think uh, Phosphor G as being the Linux of the GIS world. So any kind of software that exists in the proprietary environment, you have uh, equivalent, uh, which is completely free and is built by the community. It's backed up by people like you, by, like me, that have interest on this type of technology. Uh, the reasons of why you should care, I think it's pretty clear, it's free. So we have in hand the tools to do whatever you want. Uh, once you leave the academic, the academy, you lose access to all this beautiful environment that we have here. But let's say that you start working in a non-profit organization or start working overseas in developing countries doing this type of GIS. So I think that's uh, really important to have a uh, Pre and a Phosphor G set of tools under our belt so you can never stop exploring the GIS. Uh, another thing that why you should start caring is the learning experience is a little different from what you are used to do with proprietary software. Most of your learning experience is going to be from the internet, going to be from the community, so it's built by people like you and by people by people that has all kinds of problem and therefore they look for other peers to for solutions. So I would say that there's no one recipe to learn Phosphor G. You learn as you go, so you have a problem, you look online for a solution, and there you go. And hopefully you're gonna pass your knowledge ahead to others like you. Uh, and to say that the third, one of the third reasons to why Phosphor G is very exciting is because it's something that's being built by constantly. Uh, QGIS, for instance, has like three new versions per year. So if there's something that you hate about on that software, you can tell to the community, tell to the developers, and and they probably can address this on the on the future version. That's in, compared to the black box that is the proprietary uh, software. Uh, you you change. You can make the changes happen. So, and also Phosphor G is a matter of making connections to get the job done. Uh, right here, we have just a single set of Phosphor G technologies, free and open source technologies to, let's say, to display a map on the web. Uh, that's make ourselves clear, those softwares, those platforms are not the only platforms out there. They're just examples, but are several flavors. It all depends on the type of job that you are doing, uh, how comfortable you feel using a given software. But the whole idea is on the center, we have the Postgres SQL, which is a relational database management system. It's a very, very powerful one. Uh, people like to compare Postgres to Oracle which is a proprietary, also very powerful. And some say like to defend that Postgres is better. Uh, but it, again, it's up to you to decide uh, once you try both. And 
PulseJS, that's going to be uh, something that we're going to be focused here tonight, is just an extension to Postgres. So Postgres just work with tables, rows, columns, has no idea what to do with a spatial data. Post PostGIS just add functions and teach Postgres how to work with spatial data. That we, that is what we do. Uh, we have QGIS, which is a desktop software, similar to Mark, so any other uh, type of software. Uh, there are other desktop software for GIS uh, out there. You you can pick your uh, your favorite. But I would say that QGIS is the standard right now. Uh, it's, it's growing in power in the, the last years. It's become more and more user friendly. Uh, people like to start learning GIS using QGIS since it's free. You can download and install in a very painless process. Uh, after that, we have our data. So we create data on QGIS. We put on the Postgres, Postgis database, and we send away to the GeoServer. GeoServer is a, just a web service platform uh, that makes the connection between the database and, and a client-side uh, application, and that is Leaflet. Leaflet is also a very new in the market, but it has a lot of potential to grow. It's very easy to use. Uh, you, it requires some JavaScript knowledge, but you can get hold really, really quickly. Uh, so, there you go, it's just a matter of making connections and the better part of all this is it's all free. So you can leave this here tonight and go to your house and download all these and start playing by yourself. No strings attached. Uh, notice how I put the PostJS and PostGRES in the center and the reason for this is I believe that any good JS project have to start with a good database. Uh, database has to be the heart of your project. And once you start <laughs> databases, you start noticing how. But I have here uh, three reasons of why a database is important in, the, in our next JS project. The first is definitely it can organize our data. You know, JS projects, we definitely know how things can get messy. When we download new data, we move, we paste, we copy, we change the name. So the end of the project, we end up with a folder, thousands and thousands of data that's kind of useful. Uh, and a database just makes everything easier. We organize into lists. Okay. So we organize in a very uh, logical pattern that you can follow, uh, you can, others can easily understand what our data is and what is contained inside it. And I think that leads to the next reason actually. It can protect our data against ourself. Because in JS projects we are always looking for new, we need data. Uh, and therefore, we are constantly making copies, moving, deleting, and that stuff that inside a database would not happen. Because once you upload data into the database, it's going to put a folder on your C drive or your, any local drive that you have no idea where the folder is. I mean, you can know, of course, but you don't want to. You let the database handle your data instead of yourself. That's the best step that you can do towards a uh, more effective GIS problem. And after that, it becomes, it becomes your starting point for any type of project. Let's say it's just a web map. So that database is going to be the source of the data for that web map. Let's say you are working with a desktop uh, GIS. That database is going to be the source of the data for QGIS or so which is very cool. Uh, I think we should now start looking at what is actually Postgres and what you can do inside. Uh, this here is called the QG Admin. Uh, it is just a graphic user interface of Postgres. You can use Postgres using a console, a common line based, but why? You know, since we have uh, graphic user interface, I think for a daily use, it's much more friendly. Uh, I think then you can 
learn really, really quickly how to use it. So here I have uh, the Denver database with uh, some data sets about the scene of Denver. And we're gonna be doing some queries to see what we can do with a uh, database. So, and I, and I prepared these queries uh, just for the sake of time and to avoid any awkward mistake. So the first one we're gonna be doing is, Perfect. All right, so this query here, uh, for those who have JS experience, a query is something that we are already used to work uh, on an everyday basis. So this query here just says that give me the name and the population of the neighborhoods in Denver. Some stuff, things that we're gonna do every day, probably, in, or any type of JS project, you're gonna do something like that. We're just, we're just retrieving data from a table. Can you and get that? press S5 or the run button. Here we go. No. So, and I also ask the query to return then the population number in a descending order. So we have the biggest one first, and then we go down. So you have more. Then we have the name of the neighborhood and the population. Oh, you see, it returned 78 rows. It's not a large data set, but it runs pretty quickly. Try again. Okay. Um, and that's another nice thing about databases. Uh, to retrieve data, to make spatial analysis, it's way faster than any uh, desktop software because you are not rendering the geometries. You are just looking at the information, the table information or the spatial information. So since we are working with GIS data, nice to have spatial queries. This one here is just like the previous one, except by we are also returning the area. And this ST underline area comes from the PostJS extension, the function. Any ST function that you're gonna see online, it, ST means spatial temporal. So it comes from the, from the PostJS extension. So, and that's why you can, you can work with JS data inside Postgres because of that extension that we call it inside post, uh, Postgres. So here we are returning the name of our neighborhood and we're gonna call this the column as neighborhood, just make sense. Uh, this specific data is in state plane projection. Okay. And that's something that you have to be aware of when working with GIS data inside the Postgres. Um, the projection is very, very important. Sometimes we download data from the internet that has no projection at all, so we have to reproject into a project that makes sense. So, something you're gonna see in a few moments when you work with two types of database, not, sorry, not database, but data sets, they has to be in the same projection. Otherwise, the spatial analysis will not work. Uh, Don't and bite as I said, use uh, oh. feet as units. Oh, yeah. So we are returning the area of each uh, polygon, or yeah. uh, each yeah. But yeah. instead of having the, that area in square feet, which makes no sense at all at this scale, we are just dividing by this number to get in acres. So there you go. So we make the calculation, we return the, the area of each geometry in, the, in that data set. So you see here, uh, and that data comes straight from the city, so the city sees DIA as being a neighborhood, so it's the biggest neighborhood in the, in the city, and after that, it has Stapleton, and so forth, so on. Uh, and also, inside the Denver database, we have the street center line. This is a streets data set for the city of Denver. So we can also do something that's really cool and way easier than, a, than any, any uh, desktop. Mm -hmm. yeah, desktop. That is to calculate both area and length. Because usually what happens inside the desktop is that area or the length will be 
in the in the unit of the projection, right? So there'll be thousands of square feet, which makes no sense since it's not apartment; it's a, it's a whole neighborhood. And the same for streets. So inside the database, we can just get that in, and convert it. We can well, can apply any um, any calculation in our query and then return whatever in whatever format we want. Uh, here, there's no. Here there is no, uh, we are just returning the in feet, but we go here and divided by 4,280, right? Get that into miles. But notice there's something really weird here. It says that the longest road in Denver is Dan Boulevard outbound, whatever that means. And has and it is just two miles. Why is that? The reason is because this data comes straight for the city, and the city divides up a road into sections, right? And you notice here that returns twenty nine thousand roads, so that's a lot of streets to be in just one city. So one thing that we can do is we can expand it. Group or streets based on their names. You can see this as being a dissolve process that we that we usually do in a in a soft in a desktop environment, right? Oh. That's new for me. There you go. So here you have it. Uh, it returned two thousand roads and streets, which is plausible. And the longest one, it says that's private road, 99 miles. Weird, right? So let's check this data inside our QGIS. I think that's a good segue. Um, and here I have a connection to the PostGIS. It's really, it's really straightforward to make connections between our database and QGIS. Uh, both softwares like to talk with each other. They are very friendly. Uh, so let's add here. Right, so that's the streets of Denver. Let's open the output table. Yep, and make a query. And let's see what is that private road. Go and has to be equals. Right. Should work, hopefully. I did it. Once again. Oh, that should be the full name, if you right. Cool. Okay. Those are the private roads that, in total, sum to 99 miles in there. You see? Those are just a bunch of roads scattered across the city. And that's the type of thing that you can, the type of information that you can get from a database, just run one single query. Instead of putting straight to QGIS, start doing whatever analysis you want, and at the end you notice, oh, there's this private road that, get, that got into my analysis that shouldn't be there. So we, were, so we are aware that this thing exists in your data set. Get down from there. Get down from there. Ooh, um, yeah. Next function that I want to talk about is the intersect. Uh, that's a process that is oh. very common. Yeah. Oh. Leave the catalog. Oh. So there you go. If you press S5, what is that? It's asking to return the name of the streets and the name of the neighborhood given the condition that the streets and the neighborhood have to cross. And we decided here to see which streets cross the CBD, the Central Business District in Denver downtown. And you see, we have 24 streets. And also here we have to group by, by, uh, by name of the streets and by name of the neighborhoods. Otherwise, we would get probably more than um, 
and four since then. Uh, no. One name of street made no. this several times in the data set since there are different sections of that street. Uh, but you see, it's a, this query here is very interesting because this process in the desktop environment will take at least two other processes. Uh, to, uh, to select the CBD and then have to run an uh, intersect tool just using that selection. So it is more steps, you're gonna re-render re at least two times, you know, it's gonna take more time for that. Um, but, let's see, okay, yeah, with me. Uh, another one that's very uh, common in the JS practice is the within function. Uh, this function just checks if one geometry is inside another, and that's it. So here, I'm gonna run it, and this one is asking to return the name of the library stations and the name of the neighborhood, given the condition that the library stations has to be inside <coughs> a neighborhood. So it runs this function and then aggregates. So, so here, for instance, uh, on this neighborhood, Baker, we have Alameda Station and I-25, and so far so on. It's very, it's fast, it's clean, because sometimes in JS we don't want to create a map. We just want tabular data, we just want a number. So I believe that any process that can speed up the times of processing, uh, any platform that can make things lighter, it's welcome. Uh, even though QJS re rendering times in QJS are very fast, actually. Even for big uh, data sets, you just saw that street data sets very big, and but rendering time was quite fast, uh, but not as fast as the Postgres. Uh, and of course, you can we can kind of intersect uh, geometry analysis, geometry uh, query to tabular information, to get something that has more information, is more useful for us. So let's expand this intersect uh, query here. And now we are also asking for the population. And there you have it. It's, it. it's simple. Uh, it takes some time to get your head around how the logic of uh, SQL uh, works. But after a while, you can create your own queries, you can create queries just to solve entire uh, spatial problems. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I do have one last here, um, which is really interesting because uh, similar process in any desktop software would take at least two or three process, different process. Uh, and that is the distance within, which you can. So this is the function, st underscore distance within. And it just checks, given a geometry, is this other geometry on a proximity given this radius here? So I just gave this number since it's one mile. So what it's asking is, give me all the stations within one mile, no, give me all the neighborhoods, sorry, give me all the neighborhoods within one mile of a station. There you go. So it says here that from this specific station, the unit station neighborhood is within a mile. <laughs> and there we go. Yeah. And that's something that inside a desktop uh, software, you have to first create buffers around the stations, at least in QGIS. Uh, and then you're gonna have to intersect. And lastly, you're gonna have to solve. Uh, the solve, in this case, is not required but if we need the total population within one mile 
of a station, we, we will have to solve it. Here you have it. Within one mile of the nine mile station, which is almost in Aurora and just touch, very touched a neighborhood of Denver, we have 4,000 people that live actually in Denver. And so on. So you see how a database is much more than just store data. A database can be your gearbox, a toolbox uh, for any kind of spatial analysis. As long as you know which function you have to use, and if you don't know, that's that's completely all right. Uh, the documentation for PostGIS is really, really good, actually. Uh, it goes function by function, little description, and then has more information about that function, more examples. It's really nice to use, uh, user-friendly. Uh, and that is the type of analysis that you can do using OJS. Um, uh, the last thing that I want to show you what you can do using PostGIS is you can serve web map services. You can, you can get data from the database and display into a web page. And that's something that this examples uh, shows here. This data, it's data about historical buildings in Denver, downtown. So we have our 1925-1961. And all this data is stored right here. Uh, let me... Yeah, uh, that's Denver. Down, down. Here we go. So if you run a uh, query, Select me, uh, the asterisk means everything. Uh, what is the name of the table? Mm. Should be something like 25. It's double quotes. Oh. Of course, and this is the tabular data of that data set that's being displayed on the on the web page. You see, you have name, you have description, number of floors, material, all that, and this is what makes PostJS so magic. This column here is a column created by the PostJS, and this column with this very long line of numbers is the geometry of that polygon. That's something that you don't have to know how to read that, but sure enough, PostJS knows how to. And every single uh, spatial query that you run, use this column, because this is the, 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 this is the spatial information about the, that polygon or line or point on, on space. Okay. So back into our uh, little application, the web API, I would say the bare bone here uh, that allows us to zoom and all that is Leaflet. And one thing that's nice about Leaflet, it's very light to render stuff. So you click here, it just go over there. And we just, you can click and you can get the information straight from the database. And the bridge between the database and Leaflet is your server another open source uh, platform. So I hope that uh, this presentation create more questions than answers actually. And that's just uh, some quick examples of what you can do using uh, open source Phosphor G. Uh, you can create your own database. So let's say that project that you did one year ago that lives in a very dirty folder on your computer, that, but you love that data, you don't want to lose that thing, you can create a database from that. And you can back, it, back that up. One thing that's nice about Postgres is the, uh, the backup of a database this is just one file, and that's it. So you can send that file to another person. The risks of corrupt that file are minimum. Uh, it's very easy to store that backup and to restore a database is also very, very easy. Um, 
because Postgres was actually meant to be used in enterprise environments. Uh, it's a substitute to database like uh, Oracle. You know? So actually, every single type of software here, platform, you can d deploy that in the enterprise environment. Either Leafly, GeoServer, QGIS, uh, Postgres. So don't think that just because it's open source, it's something that, okay, so it, it's good for me and my map that I showed to my friends. Of course not. That's not the case at all. It's good for everyone, you know. And I would say that another good thing about Phosphor-G and actually any type of open source is anyone can start. You know, it's very user friendly in all levels. That, because let's say, because let's face it, let's be honest, we are not computer scientists, maybe, maybe do, maybe. We are not programmers, not web developers, but the <laughs> that we have now, we can use it in scale. You see, the, the learning process is, I would say that's easier than proprietary options. Uh, it's clear what they do and what they cannot do. But to be honest, they can, they can do whatever you want. Uh, people are writing new plugins to QJS every day. You know? So you can write our own if you want to learn how to program Python if you want. And you can start from scratch. You can just download it and start free and off you go. And I'll say that the, now we are in a very exciting moment in the GIS, uh, in the geospatial science technology field because literally anyone, anywhere in the world with access to a computer, it can be, it can even be a crap computer on QGIS. You can just talk QGIS 2.0 and off you go. I met people that work in the international developing environment and they say that once Sometimes they have to go to the developing countries and they don't have this type of machines that they have here. They don't have the resources to buy a proprietary license. But whatever type of computer they have access and you can stalk QGIS and they can start doing spatial analysis and be more aware of the place that they live. And I think that's the biggest power of Phosphor-G. It's very democratic. You know. And I would say that... Those are my final remarks uh, since presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming here, spend your spare time to talk about this. Thank you. If you have uh, any questions, I'll be here. So, yep. Yeah. You mentioned there's all these new plugins for UGIS. Yes. Do you have? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the question is, if I have any favorite example or uh, any example at all about the plugins for QJS, and the thing is, QJS is very, I'd say, different from proprietary because proprietary softwares, let's say ArcGIS, they come with a ton of uh, tools right off the box. And once you go to QGIS at first, you'll think, okay, so I want you to reference something. And you can find the tool because it's a plug that I have to download and say, okay, QGIS is useless because you can reference. Of course you can, it's just a plug. So after that, you start, the first place that we start looking for stuff is in the plugin repository. So let's see if I have, um, this computer do not have any plug installer, I guess. Uh, let's see. I thought I had a uh, heat map. It's really cool. It creates a heat map from the concentration of points. It's really, really, really easy to, to do. Uh, even though we have no idea what's going on under the hood, you know, maybe you don't care, maybe you do, but it's really easy. Uh, I tried to do something similar using um, Arc, and you know, I gave up because it was way more complex than I wish. Uh, the due reference, of course. Uh, the due reference process QJS is similar to ARC. Uh, you just have to create the, the control points. Um, let's see. I don't have installed it here, but there's a plugin that you can load uh, OpenStreetMaps layer. So you can load the imagery, uh, 
real data. And actually to download that data, it's also a very simple process as well. So you can download, so you can load OpenStreetMaps and you can download all those roads as vectors instead of just being a plain JPEG. Uh, it's also very cool. So those are my favorites, I guess, more useful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So first, uh, yeah, uh, oh yeah, I forgot that part, sorry. Uh, how to connect uh, Post.js into QGIS? Let's see, do I have any other database that's not connected? Let's see. No, I do not, but I think I can delete one. That's uh, the Sao Paulo connection. So you just double click uh, new connection or even easier, you can go over here and create a new table. Here, you're gonna have to create a new connection. Those are the connections that are, are already uh, connecting to queue. But in this case, we want to create a new one. So let's call some problem. The the database is has to be the same name as it is in Q in PostJS. So it's like this. All right. So the username has to be the same <coughs> super user that you specify when you install Postgres. Uh, usually, the standard one is. Postgres. And the password it has to be the password that is specified <coughs> Sorry. on the installation. So it is, you can save it, you can password, you can test the connection, plus successful, which is great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you are save a password, okay, I know, thank you for reminding me. Uh, you can click connect. Then we can, let's add as many layers as we want. Uh, if you go the process from here, you're gonna ask to, it's a process to add a layer, but since you don't want that, and you can just go to the browser <coughs> and refresh, of course, very much refresh, and our new database is right here. And these are all the data that I have um, here, let's travel, choose a follow, there we go. So it's a very easy, painless, you, there's some things that you have to pay attention, especially when you install Postgres, don't forget the password and the username that is specified. I did this once, and you, you are able to retrieve that information, but have to go really, really deep the whole stuff. You know, it's always better to keep track of what you're doing instead of just next. Any other question? <laughs> yeah. How many records? I think the biggest, the largest one is. 29,000, 29, 29,000. Uh, that would be the street database. But I used it Postgres once to retrieve information from the National Emissions Inventory, from EPA. And that thing is a table with, I think that's more than 40 million rows. Because it's the emission for a given pollutant that comes from the production of paint. And then again for a different pollutant, same process for all kinds of, you know. And it took like five minutes to retrieve in Postgres. And you can join, you can cut, you can create no tables, you know. And that's a good, another thing about Post, Postgres and I would say any uh, database management, management system, except access, of course. Uh, it's really meant to be used with big data. You know, and that national emissions inventory is an example. It, you, you cannot open a CSV of that, of that size in Excel, trust me. 
or even access. But you just send away to Postgres and there you go. It works. Yeah. So the question is what well, right. Well, so the question was what is the fastest, easiest way to learn PostJS and QGIS? PostJS, I started learning using the boundless.com uh, tutorials. They have a really good series of uh, intro, introductory tutorials for PostJS. Uh, they use real world data from New York, so it's easy to relay instead of. Because what happens is if you go out there and buy a book about PostGRES or even the PostJS, I would say the first five, four chapters is very abstract. They talk about geometries that are squares or circles. That's a very good foundation. But for practical use, I mean, you, you, you want to get your hands, your hands dirty as soon as possible, right? So for PostJS, is boundless, I would say. QGIS, uh, I'd say that any resource on their website is good. There's a really good uh, blog for PostGIS that now I forgot the name. But every time I need anything, I just Google what I need and that blog comes up. Uh, that's something that's really nice about QGIS is there's a really tons of tutorials. You know, tutorials of good pictures, uh, the smallest amount of text as possible. So those are the resources. Yes. You say PostGIS and PostGRES, are you talking about the same thing or two different things? Uh, two different things, actually. So the difference between PostGRES and PostGIS is PostGRES SQL, that's the full name of the thing we call PostGRES, uh, is the, it's the system, it's the whole environment for a database. So right off the box, you can upload any kind of tabular data into that. PostGIS is an ex spatial extension to PostGRES. So PostGIS teaches uh, your database that that column, G-O-M column, has geometries existing in a given space. Uh, and PostGIS has all, all the functions, all the spatial functions that we use on these examples. So you first install PostGRES SQL, you create our database, yeah. of course, after that you you install uh, PostGIS. It's almost the same process. Uh, you're gonna show up a list of extensions that you can install if you want, if you want to install, and then you create a database and we have to make the extension. You have to bring PostGIS into that database, otherwise it will not work. But that's the relationship between the two. And there's also the PG routing that's uh, for uh, network analysis. Uh, it's similar to PostGIS, it's spatial related, but it's more for uh, find shortest path, all that uh, network stuff that you do on the desktop. Yeah. I know with Esri stuff, you can find a ton of tutorial um, videos on YouTube. I found that with like uh, oh, Q. Q, where a lot of people uploaded. Stuff. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, one thing that I found uh, which is really nice is people tend to translate uh, other people tutorials to other languages. Uh, I saw tutorials showing how to uh, use a given plugin in QGIS, and a guy right in the comments, okay, for my Italian folks, here's a tutorial that I did in Italian. So I'd say that. And another thing that's really cool is people are really willing to help you, whatever the, the matter. I mean, you go to Stack Overflow and just post your question. Okay, I'm trying to do this, 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 and doesn't work, here's my code. And in this case, when I had problems with the, that web page. And let's say that next morning I had like three replies. Okay, try this, try this, try this. You know, people are really willing to help each other, you know. I think that's the same with Asri, but I'd say that the open source is more beautiful. <laughs> Under? Yeah. What's the best way to learn SQL? The best way to learn SQL? Uh, w3schools. 
has a really good tutorial process. Uh, it's basic SQL, but for Postgres, can get you up and running really, really fast. Uh, other, another resource? I don't think so. I think W3 is a really, it's the nicest start that you can have. And PostJS is, you can find other more specific uh, uh, tutorials for those uh, functions. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, really appreciate it. it. Was really nice to share the Phosphor G word with you guys. And hopefully, you guys are gonna get home and gonna install either QJS or or open our <laughs> Yes. It's recording. For for those of you remotely, and also those of you guys here. We're gonna post the slides as well as the recording for this presentation on the Phos4G Lab website. You go to the tab tutorials, there will be an entry there for, for videos on the slides. So you'll find that hopefully within the next two weeks. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you for everyone.